How we doing tonight? It is Friday rapid fire. Everyone is fired up and, and ready to go up in here tonight. Vince D'Addario, Jesse Styers, Sean Myers coming to you from all points. Vince is in a little bit different location today. No, no, uh, no IB banner in the background. No, but I actually have my my IB uh, flag. I'll, I'll give you guys a little. It's over there, actually. It's a permanent resident of my office at uh, at work. So I do have it. I have an IB presence at the office. But uh, yeah, Fridays are going to be from the office from here on out because the kids got track practice till five thirty, and got to do what you got to do. Can't be two places at once. So that's right. Yep. Here we are. So you get the, the view <laughs> from the office. Here we are. Here we are. Well, I see Brandon K has got a ton of Olivia Miles questions going yeah. on after the big shot she hit last night. Oh. We'll be talking about that. Awesome. In a little bit. That's uh, that's one of our questions. It's uh, it's in the queue for rapid fire yes, it is. today. I hope everybody did their homework. I'm, uh, I'm no ready. breaking news today mm -hmm. uh, to get us started. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But you know, we have <laughs> we have nothing breaking right now, so we have nothing to fix. I guess. Hit the like button as you enter the show tonight. Glad to have you with us. And uh, I think maybe first time chatter, Wayne, uh, TGIF boys. Great call last night, Sean. Great win. Get the uh, end of the crazy week. Yeah. And now it's now it's off to Pittsburgh <laughs> to, tomorrow. I mean, it was a great call, by the way. I, I finally figured out how to sync up my TV with the app on my okay. phone so I could listen to a little Sean Styers while I'm watching the game. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. I enjoyed it. I don't much. think anybody's ever done that before. So thanks and congratulations. Well, I'm sure many people have done it before, but I, I just, there's certain things I just can't listen to. And a lot of, and no offense to you, of course, a lot of the TV women's basketball play by play, especially the regular season. It's not great. And I know what you bring to the table. And so it was great to have the visual and the audio at the same time. Well, they had their A-team there last night, Ryan Rucco and uh, Rebecca Lobo. I did see that. There. Yeah, I did right. see that. And, of course, you got the – you. we had the uh, the classic shot of Marcus Freeman as well. That's true. That's true. Sidelines. He was there with a couple of his kids. So – but Let's save supportive. that. We'll save that. We've got all kinds of Olivia Miles right. conversation coming up. We can get to that here in a little bit. But again, good to have you with us. Hit the like button, subscribe, rate, review, comment, all those great things. And let's get going with rapid fire tonight. So fill in the blank. It's blank that Notre Dame Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick has sent a form email to respond to fans who voiced their displeasure with him about the botched Andy Ludwig negotiation and in that email, Swarbrick started it by paraphrasing James Earl Jones as Terrence Mann in the movie Field of Dreams, and he ended it by including a link inviting fans to donate money. Vince, do you want to get us going with this one? It was a lot. I'm going to say it was a lot because there were so many things in there. First of all, starting out with the James Earl Jones quote, it's like this isn't a sophomore year five paragraph essay that's, that you're putting together. That's exactly what I thought. It's <laughs> like it's like I'm in college and I'm coming like I'm gonna I'm gonna quote Terrence Mann, you know, <laughs> from, from Field of Dreams. This will be my catchy little like that catchy was little weird. quote in my sophomore essay, English essay. You know? That was weird. And I was referring to like sophomore year of high school, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that was strange to start off with, right? And then, of course, you get the spin about how they didn't accept it right away, but they did, you know, they had full intention of paying and all of those different. I mean, complete spin. We know this. If you're on the message board, you read it. It's it's complete and utter spin at this point. And then he had the gall at the end to ask for a donation when to I the first, Rodney Fund. Before I saw the letter, I heard about the letter and I'm like, this can't be. This can't be real. Like he didn't really, you know, oh like gosh. he didn't really scold people and then hit them up, you know, with with the donation link at the end. And then, you know, I saw obviously it's like yes, he did. Yes, he yes, did. I saw yes, actual copies of this letter. Since I, you know, since none of us actually 
wrote an email to Jack Swarbrick complaining. We didn't get one directly, but we no. had forwarded to us by you know, it just I, I can't something. even believe like he would sit at his computer and put and type that out and be like, Yep, this is going out to everybody. He would have been better Your off goal. just not responding at all. I'm going to go with spiteful in this situation for that reason, because it <laughs> felt like it was him just just kind of giving the finger back to everyone. It felt rambly. It felt like a, a long run on that just kind of didn't really say much. And then at the end, he said, hey, you made fun of me that we can't pay the bills. So here's the, the donation link uh, to give us the money, because apparently, you know, we don't we can't do that. So, again, it, it, it felt very like spiteful and a bit. um like sarcastic in in nature too. Like it, it, it felt like he was doing it with kind of some some spite in his heart when writing that email. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. there was some something in his heart. Well, you know, you guys know I love a good movie quote, so um, I brought my own movie quotes Ooh, tonight. Nice. So allow me to retort Samuel L. Jackson as Jules Winfield, Pulp Fiction. What we've got here is a failure to communicate. Strother Martin as Captain Cool Hand Luke. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson as Colonel Jessup, Tom Cruise as Lieutenant J.G. Caffey, a few good men. This aggression will not stand, man. Jeff Bridges as the dude, the big Lebowski. <laughs> you shut your mouth when you're talking to me. Rebecca, Rebecca de Mornay as Mrs. Kroger, wedding crashers. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Mandy <laughs> Patinkin as Inigo Montoya, the Princess Bride. You sit on a throne of lies. Will Ferrell as Buddy the Elf in Elf. <laughs> Show me the money. Cuba Gooding Jr., Rod Tidwell, and Jerry Maguire. Greed, for a lack of a better word, is good. Michael Douglas, Gordon Gecko. Wall Street. I think they all fit here, you know. Like if, if we're just gonna pick and choose just, just you know, our own movie lines and, and paraphrase, I think they all fit <laughs> this specific, you know. It's like you said, Vince. I could, you know, you could go anywhere and and you know randomly plug some in. It just you know, after smugly throwing people's passion for Notre Dame back in their face, you know, let's be sure, you know, to to to, to pass the hat now so that yeah. you know, we're, we're going to take money at the end of this whole thing. It's, it's just ridiculous that, that he would include a link to donate money. And, but, you know, by the way, he waited three days yeah. to issue any clarification of the initial report that he mentions, you know, the Pete, Tham he didn't mention Pete Thamel by name, but he's talking about a national reporter. And then he talks about, you know, without seeking any clarification from us, some of the individuals who comment on Notre Dame football concluded <laughs> this meant, no, this was all sourced information. And, and quite frankly, we, you know, we know who our sources are and they gave us all the details, a, a lot of monetary details before he ever came back trying to back it up with, with all this double talk. You know, there's there's some sort of half truths in there and, you know, like semantics that he's trying to play with in, in all of this. But quite frankly, we know the truth and everything that's been reported on Irish breakdown. I would, I, I, I back that much more strongly than, than what I'm taking out of this email. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Are you kidding me? Like it was, it's, it's such a reactionary move by Jack Swarbrick and the administration or whoever you want to involve in that group, because obviously Jack is the head of this of this thing, it's such a reactionary move. Like I said before, he would have been better off just not saying anything. Just don't even respond. He would have been better off doing it. I completely doing it. agree. It, it, I completely it just, agree. It sounds, it sounds petty, like you said. It's It just sounds desperate. It sounds like you're grasping at straws, and you're just making excuses is what it sounds like. He'd have been better off, number one, not saying anything at all, or number two, just saying, hey, we got this. Don't worry about it. Like, I just don't get don't like, even... the whole, here we are. You know, we've, we've, you know, we already, even though, again, he's trying to defend whether or not they were going to pay, you know, the buyout. Based on what we know, they were willing to pay the initial buyout, the one they thought was much lower. Right. But then once they found out it was actually much, much higher than it was going to be that's when they came back and said, no, we're not going to pay that. And then, 
you know, again, like whether or not after this whole report blew up, they went back to Andy Ludwig and tried to save some face. And at that point, Andy Ludwig said, no, I'm staying put, which seems like that's probably what happened. Sure. If, you know, if Andy Ludwig, you know, the cold feet thing and, and the whole thing, whatever cold feet he allegedly had came well after all this stuff had blown up Correct. in the media. And so he'd already, and he'd already said, I'm staying at Utah at that point. You know what right. I mean? He was right. He, he was signed, sealed, delivered. He was coming to Notre Dame and he's probably bringing his old line coach Harding with him. And they said, no. And so at that point, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to say, Hey, I'm staying at Utah. And then you put all that out there. And what, how's he supposed to look now that Notre Dame comes back with their tail between their legs because they're trying to save face and they're like, Oh, well, uh, no, we would have paid your buyout. Is he supposed to then be like, Oh, thank God. I was hoping right. you guys would come back. And again, uh, we're talking about a university with a well-renowned multi-billion dollar yes. endowment. And at the end of this, he includes a link to the Rockney fund. And I, you know, that's like, I clicked on it to make sure that it actually went there and it does, <laughs> it goes right there. And it's like, donate however much you want. And it's like, so you know, we didn't pay the buyout this time, but be sure to donate. So next time there's yeah. a buyout to be had, we can afford it. You know, and if like, they really wanted to pay the buyout, they're not taking it out of the Rockney fund anyway. They're going to exactly. contact a donor or two and they're exactly. going to donate the money for the buyout. And there were plenty of donors, as we all found out, as Jack found out when his his inbox kept blowing up. There were plenty of guys out there that were willing to foot the bill for that buyout. He didn't ask because he didn't want it to happen period correct like, anything else is anything else you hear from another reporter whether it's national or otherwise they're just carrying notre dame's water well and that's that's exactly what i was going to say is uh, what i can't believe is a fairly well respected national reporter continues to carry jack swarbrick's Which water in this get. whole thing like taking everything he says as gospel you know and I don't get that at all it's just amazing to me it's i respect that reporter i respect right. the 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 opinions of that reporter and it just it's unbelievable that that reporter continues to, to carry carry the water there's no better term for it right it's carry the water. It's, it's the only one at this right. point who's who's backing up his version of yeah. events there's one you know, local it. beat writer that i i feel is kind of on that boat but it's really the national writer that's really doing it too it's just it's embarrassing, frankly, at this point. Yep, I agree. Jesse, do you have anything to add before we move on? <laughs> you guys are in on a tangent. I didn't, I didn't know how to interject myself on that one. And I, I feel like any at any point, I would just be like, "Yep, mm -hmm, yep." <laughs> like there was really much, not much more uh, for me to add. And it just, I guess, the frustrating part is, you know, Jack Schwarbrick. I feel like has shown that he's very two faced in, in a lot of instances because he says that he wants to do one thing, um, doesn't back it up and then kind of further, you know, covers up his mistake by not really being, you know, straightforward and honest by any means. And that, I guess that that's the most frustrating thing. But mm -hmm. how can that change? You know, everyone's going to say, oh, fire Jack Schwarbrick. But, you know, it, it's just it is what it is at this point, it feels like, which is unfortunate for the fan base and Marcus Freeman in this situation. Yeah, because, you it know, is. there's a line in there about, you know, whatever, like, couldn't be further from the truth. And, you know, again, based on all the sourcing we have, it is much, much, <laughs> it is the truth. You know, it's it's not far from the truth. It is the truth. And he's still on that hill, you know, defending his stance and you know it's like you, you kind of wonder like did he realize that people were gonna share this thing once he hit send oh my god on those emails <laughs> it only it only takes one it only takes yeah. one person to just share it out and then it becomes viral and didn't take long yep. for us to get the full copy of that i agree i agree with what you it's i was thinking the same thing before you said it vince i think he would have been better off just not responding to anybody than issuing this response or, or just just something very short and to the point Thank you for your input. We will take it into consideration. Yeah. Whatever. By the way, here's a link to the Rockney Fund. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and look, we have the link to the Rockney yeah. Fund. That's like that's we, just we insult have, to injury, you know? Absolutely. We, we look, we have all sat down and written that angry email, right? It's 
I, or tweet advice, or text message. Yes, exactly. And the best advice I've ever gotten from people is 24 hours, man. Type it out, write it out, do whatever you got to do. And that's what Jack should have done. You type out <laughs> this save mine to the drafts. <laughs> yes. And, and just wait before you hit send. Just reread it. Wait. If you need to, you know, like have yeah. somebody check it. Somebody else. Mind is, do, do people really even care? Is it really that serious of a. Yeah, exactly. You really want to go down that road? Do we? <laughs> Uh, it it should never have pushed send on that. It's a bad like there was a bad look already that just got worse. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, do you guys feel any differently about Marcus Freeman today compared to say a week ago at this time? Go ahead, Jess. You know, honestly, I don't really feel too much indifferent about Marcus Freeman. Um, I feel bad actually for Jared Parker because this whole situation takes the spotlight off of someone, you know, who's potentially, I mean, we don't know what he's going to be and it could be really great. And, you know, but I feel like it, it definitely takes the spotlight off of him. Um, but going back to Marcus Freeman, I don't necessarily feel that anything's uh, changed about him. I, I think I, I, I might sense that, you know, that there's some mistrust or how much do people trust him enough to run the program, how he wants to run it type situation. But for how I feel about Marcus Freeman, and what he's going to do going forward, I don't I don't think I, I feel any different about it. I actually, I don't know that I feel any different, but I do have a, a good amount of respect for Freeman with the way this whole thing went down because he could have gone a whole different direction on this from a just being pissed off standpoint. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and he didn't. He pivoted very quickly to kind of whatever plan, if you want to call it plan B, or like the next road, like he pivoted instantly, went out and got a quarterback's coach. And once that happened, we all knew what that meant is that he was probably going to promote uh, from within with Parker, right? So he pivoted very quickly. He didn't waste any time. You know, he decided, look, if we're not going to go the route that I wanted to go, then we're going to go this route where I know who these guys are. I trust these guys. We're going to bring them in. And I think it was... Was I listening? I, yeah, I was listening to uh, Brian's show the other day. You're going to build a fence. You're going to build a fence around the football program, and we're going to do it my way. And sink or swim, this is the way we're going to do it. So if you're not going to support me, then I'm going down this road, and that's how we're going to do it. I think he pivoted pretty quickly, and he could have – it could have gone a different direction for him, I, I feel like. You know, he could have been mad. He could have been upset or whatever. He pivoted quickly. He got what he wanted. Yeah. And he moved on. I have respect for that. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, I already had a lot of respect for him. And, you know, there's a lot of really good things that came out of the first year, you know, despite four losses and, you know, who they lost, you know, but so like that, you know, we, we already know that's there. You know, Mm -hmm. we've talked about how he adjusted and, and, and adapted on the fly as the season went on and all those different things. But just the things you were talking about right there, the reason I respect him I think more is like, while all this stuff is blowing up in everybody's face, he didn't like sit back and wait and react. He went right out and he was like, okay, if, if, if that's how we're going to play this, if if that's the way this is going to go, I'm just getting my guy and I'm going to show you that, that my guy is going to work and I'm going to go with my guys. And, you know, like you said, if you want to call it, build a wall, build a fence, whatever around yourself. We talked about it earlier in the week, Vince, as coaches, I I think that where this is right now, the best thing you can do is surround yourself with, you know, as long as you feel like they're competent people, but also people that you can trust around you. And it's like, you, you, you be sure that the message you want out there is getting out there and you've got your guys around you guys who you can work with and guys who can work together. And I think it was, you know, again, it's like he didn't sit back and and wait as the week went on and like, what are we going to do now? Who are we going to go after now? He made a very decisive decision. Went, you know, they they interviewed Jared Parker apparently right away, and he yeah. also obviously went out and got Gadelli uh, uh, right away, and and made that move. And now all we're waiting on is the offensive line coach and, and figuring out who that's going to be. And then, you know, like 
Last night, he's sitting there just like he's always been, you know, with uh, some of the Notre Dame women's basketball games. He's been there yeah. half the season, it seems like, I and he's know, always right? got one of his kids with him sitting <laughs> front row center. There he was, you know, out for everybody to see, sitting in the front row, taking in the bas uh, basketball game in a very public place. So I've got a lot of respect for that. And, it, and it's amazing. It, it's so funny that when, when the you-know-what hits the fan – you know, in, in the fans' eyes or in the media's eyes or whatever with Marcus Freeman in this offseason and all of that. He's at the basketball game. Like, yeah. it's just and, – and and somehow things are still getting done. You know what I mean? He still has time to be and support, you know, support the, the women's program, be with his family, you know, all of those different things, and he's still getting it done, you know, with his job. So it's just – it's amazing to me that he's able to do that without any issue. It's just – I like it because it's not normal at Notre Dame. I'll say that. True. So, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him at some baseball games and like, because that's just who he is. Right. You know, that's just who he is. And then, you know, meanwhile, his son's battling it out in the state finals for wrestling, you know? And, and I was going to say, and he was there with him at, at one of those games last week, I guess right. it was. So, yeah. yeah. For the Duke game. Yep. Absolutely. His, his son, Vinny, down there. Good luck to him at the state tournament. He's wrestling tonight. In about a At half hour, point, I would say, give or round. take. Yep, pen guy. That's right. Yep. See, right there. See, Woo. pen. <laughs> See. I don't know if enough people know about your wrestling career. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, did you ever wrestle? Yeah, mine ended in middle school. Okay. <laughs> All right. It, uh, I think fifth through eighth grade. Yeah. Okay. All right. You know, and then they bumped up to two minute periods, and I was like, ah, that's enough for me. I'm not I'm not in enough shape for that. Those one minute periods were fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just double the length of the match. And one one minute was already hard enough. Oh, that's right. That's great. <laughs> All right. So fill in the blank. Olivia Miles overtime buzzer beater to beat Louisville last night was blank. Jasco. <laughs> To me, the buzzer beater last night was uh, clutch. It was electric, um, and it was well needed because I feel like the women's team. And you know, we, I this is just an outside uh, perspective. I know we have the, the man himself that is at every women's game, but it, to me, it feels like ever since Notre Dame has kind of gone through some of their injuries the last you know you know couple month or so, they've been struggling against um, some of the other teams, just like close scores, right? Like they beat Pittsburgh by six, they beat Syracuse by nine. Um, they beat, uh, they lost to NC state by four, you know, there's just a lot of close games recently. And when you're talking about Louisville, a team that you haven't beat since 2019, I believe is the last time that they beat them, you know, it's, it's, it's what they needed. And I think it's going to give them kind of maybe, uh, some momentum or propel them to finish the rest of this season strong before the ACC tournament. Cause I believe they only have three more regular season games. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. It was awesome. I mean, I, I my son and his girlfriend were there along with my in-laws. And, you know, he comes home and he's like, Dad, did you see the ending of that game? Like, it was <laughs> awesome. It was awesome. He goes, they were down by nine. He goes, I figured it was either going to be an epic comeback or they were just going to pull away and it was going to be very defeating at the end. He's like, it was great. And then he starts going through, like, the play-by-play -play with me. Like, he was, he was, like, fired up and, like, into the game which kind of surprised me a little bit because he kind of had to be nudged, you know, to go in the first place. But what a great win, not only because of the way that they won. I mean, it was overtime, the last second shot, all of that. But as Jess alluded to, they haven't beat Louisville in forever. And that was a monkey on their back that they had right. to get rid of. And they're going to have to play him again here in like, what, a week or two, something like that. So they, week from Sunday. Yeah. Yep. To so close they're gonna the regular to, season. They're going to yep. have to play him again. And you know that Louisville is going to come at them with everything that they've got. So that it was a great battle, start to finish. You know, you know, West Belt had came up with a great opportunity, great, great time to score first five points because that put him into overtime. And uh, it was good to see Ebo back on the floor. Obviously, very limited, mm -hmm. but it was good to see her. They tried to force it to her a little bit too much, but that you know we're not really breaking down the X's and O's here. But uh, no, it was just a great game. I was riveted. I watched it from start to finish. It was fun. It was a fun watch. Yeah, and it was you know great atmosphere. And it's Louisville, as you said, they got up by nine a couple of times, mm -hmm. and that's when I started worrying based on 
last year they lost two both games i think by a combined like 58 points it, it was in those two losses and as you said they'd lost six in a row to louisville and it's like this louisville team was not nearly as good as last year's team that went to the final four but it's still i think it's it's kind of in the back of your mind it had to be in the back of their mind and i appreciate you saying that mm -hmm. town definitely it was Glad awesome somebody was listening out there but um the play itself, it was interesting because that, that final play, you know, they inbound with 3.8 seconds left. Citron's inbounding on the near sideline. She's about 10 feet to my right. And yeah. she obviously inbounds to Kylie Watson, the post player. And the play itself was supposed to get Miles the ball so she could drive to the basket. You know, she was supposed to get into the lane with it is what Michaela Mabry, one of the assistants, told me after the game when she came out for the post-game show. So, I mean, she was basically – they wanted to get her in the paint to get a closer shot, maybe draw a foul or whatever. So, you know, she starts out in backcourt, and she kind of gets a little bit of a head of steam going forward. And then, you know, with Watson there, after she takes the handoff, she can use Watson as a screen, obviously, and go either left or right. So Louisville hedges to Miles' left with a guard – so Miles goes right instead. Another guard who's a little bit bigger, you know, about the same size as Olivia, you know, but the shot was basically a total adjustment, but you never would have known it by, you know, by watching it. Yeah. The way, you know, she basically had to put it up where she did because there's one second left on the clock when she gets the, the shot up. But I mean, you talk about all the triple doubles with Olivia and all the dazzling plays and all that. And it, you kind of mentioned it, Vince. Louisville's Notre Dame's biggest rival in the mm -hmm. ACC, and they'd lost six straight to him. And Miles has been there for the last four of them the last year. And then that half season she played the year before that. And like you hear the Arike Agumbawale comparisons and, and all that kind of stuff. She's obviously a great player who made two of the most iconic shots in, in Notre Dame women's basketball history. But Olivia Miles is Olivia Miles, and she stands apart. And, you know, that shot against Louisville – is really the first big step toward her own legacy, I think. You know, like her own legacy of great, you know, because again, you can talk about all the dazzling play and all the awards that she's up for and All-American status and, you know, all those different kind of things. But, you know, that's it's a program that's had a lot of greatness and, and she's the next great player and she's got some other great teammates as well, you know, Sonia Citron in, included in that. But it was made possible because, you know, women's basketball has the, advance the ball rule as well after the timeout, you know, with a minute to play. And I'm curious what you guys think of that rule, the advance the ball rule in women's basketball, where you get the ball in front court like that. So my first question, and I should know this, but I don't, is that the case for men's basketball? No, it is not. Really? Okay. Really? I, I thought it was. Okay. Interesting. So I've always been a fan of it. Um, in the NBA because I feel like you should be rewarded for managing your timeouts throughout the game um, and, and being able to use them down at the end. And for reasons like this, you see more exciting ends to games. Um, you see well-drawn up plays that are executed. So overall, as a fan, I enjoy it more because I believe that you should, like I said, you should be rewarded for the, the, the management uh, of your timeouts throughout the entire game. So I like that you're able to advance the ball with your timeouts, and I think that the college men should also be able to do it as well. I like it. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. It, make, it definitely makes for a more uh, interesting finish to a game, and it allowed them to have, you know, what, an extra second probably because you could have advanced the ball enough, called timeout to get it to where you needed to be, but you're going to waste time doing that. Right. So you, it, it added time to it. I think it's great. I, I think it's a great rule. And you're right, Jess. It it rewards you for the way you use your timeouts if you have any left at the end. I, I like it. I like it. I do, too. Absolutely. And, you know, like the men's, you know, the NBA plays four quarters. Women's basketball, whether it's WNBA or college, plays four quarters. Men's college basketball is the only <laughs> the only level – that is still playing just two halves right now. And I yeah. think between the advance, the ball rule that we were just talking about, like it sets up those opportunities. And obviously if there had been time left on the clock after miles made her shot, Louisville 
could have done the exact same thing. Call the timeout, you get to advance, and then you've got another opportunity, you know, for maybe a, a miraculous kind of shot. And between that and the quarters, where you've got four chances at the end of each quarter, I think it creates more excitement by having it broken up like that, you know, than 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 just Oh, let you know two halves, and you don't get to it. And the you know, in the advance the ball thing is you advance it with under a minute to play, you know. So it's only in the last minute where you get to do that. So I, I think it helps create a lot of excitement. We obviously saw it last night. So we had some other questions on women's bask on Notre Dame women's basketball. Oh. Brandon, curious thoughts on Prosper and her field goal percentage. Do you think it's a freshman mental thing? Uh, she was. Was she always not that strong of a shooter? Is it bad luck? Something else. I she was definitely a strong shooter. You know, she's played on international teams, Team Canada, and and all that kind of stuff internationally the last couple of years. I would say this: like I think that by coming in in the middle of the season, it's benefiting Notre Dame right now, especially defensively, because where would they be <laughs> without her when you're without Mabry and Ebo right now? But as for the offense. I will say, like, even Olivia Miles, when she came in in midseason two years ago, she was not nearly what she was now or even what she was last year. It, it took her a while to kind of get, you know, get up to speed. So I think it's something that after she gets this year under her belt and she goes through a full offseason and all that kind of stuff, you're probably going to see some different things like talking to the coaches. They've talked about how, you know, as a shooter, in high school and in those levels, the closeout of defenders is not nearly what it is at the college level. So I, I think I think it's an adjustment period. And I'm not making excuses. I just think it's an adjustment period that that with a player of of her caliber should continue to get better sure. over the next couple of years. Yep. The, the easiest thing to be the easiest thing to be consistently good at is defense. And that tells me a lot about who a player is. Right. You, can, you can work on your shot. Your shot can get better as you get older and as you you know work your way through and get more comfortable. But what is your defense like? I I, re I really do think that that's key, and that tells me a lot about who a ball player is. Her defense is awesome. She is on the floor on a team that's fairly deep. She's on the floor when it matters defensively, and she's a part of what they're doing defensively and their success defensively. I remember you said right. last night during the game, you know, it's time for this team to show why they're one of the best defensive teams in the country when they were down by nine. And then they started getting turnovers and they, right. they started, you know, getting their hands in their arms into the passing lanes and doing all these different things. She was part of that. And she can still be a really, really good player, even though her shot's not falling, because I think her shot will eventually start to fall. She needs to get comfortable and get used to it. Yeah. For sure. And I mean, there's there's no doubt they would, you know, it'd be great if they had one more three point shooter, but sure. they don't right now. She can hit them every now and then. But right right now, it's pretty much, you know, Citron is the main three point shooter. Now she hit, I think it was three of them last night and her they were three point production. Too. Yeah, they, they, they were. And her three point production has increased with uh, with Mabry out over the what the last six, seven games, I guess it is now at this point. One more question from Brandon. He says, so stop filling the chat. With Ebo coming back, whose minutes do you think she takes, especially with Kylie starting to heat up? And, the you know, the rotation, obviously, before was Kylie Watson would start, and then Ebo would come in a couple minutes in, and, you know, she would see extended time, and then you'd see him rotating back and forth. And I think it's going to be a really good question. Neil Ivy knew going into last night that if she was going to play Ebo, it was only going to be for a few minutes. So they're, they're going to kind of have to work her, you know, back into where she's sure. ready to go. So I don't, I don't think it's going to evaporate. And I think Watson is still going to have some chances. I mean, these two games, she scored 15 the other day against Syracuse. She got 20 last night. Watson did. So that's the best back to back. It's the first time she'd been in double figures in quite a while. And the, the 20 that she got last night was just one off her career high. So I mean, you'll take her heating up at this point. Absolutely, she just needs to be hot from the free throw line. That's what. I, that's what we. Yeah, need that's because they're going to foul the crap out of her down the stretch. That's exactly, the thing. exactly. That's, it's going to be the and, and Evo is a little bit better free throw shooter. So, like, sure. even you know, if both of them are there, you're going to see more of Ebo most likely in the fourth quarter because of the right. fact that she shoots about 13, 14 percent better at the free throw line. That's a so, decent chunk. Yep. All right. 
Let me see. So let's switch to the NFL now. After seeing the Chiefs win their second Super Bowl in four years, and they've got another Super Bowl appearance in there as well, do you buy or sell the Kansas City Chiefs as a dynasty? This one's tough for me because I'm tempted to say yes because they've been in the Super Bowl three of the last four years. I mean, that's saying something, right? Can they? And they've sustained it with – different looks like different running backs, different wide receivers. Now, Travis Kelsey, obviously, you know, Mahomes, those are staples, you know, the coaching staff is a staple as least as far as Andy Reid is concerned. So I don't, I, I guess I can't say that they're a, a dynasty yet, but they're right there knocking on the door, man. They've done just about as much as you can possibly do and not be a dynasty. They get one more, they get another trophy. I'm all in on dynasty. Yeah, I'm 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 locked in on them already being a dynasty. I think you have one of the best offensive minds um in all of the NFL. I think you have the best quarterback in the whole NFL. He's got two, you know, Super Bowls, he's got two MVPs. Those are those are things that uh aren't easy to come by. So I definitely feel like they have the best player on the field and the and the guy, you know, the, the best player of probably what's going going to be the next decade or two. Um, and then you combine combine the facts that you know, they, they, this is supposed to be kind of a down year. Everyone said, oh, well, Tyreek Hill is leaving. What's that going to do for Patrick Mahomes? Um, and, you know, towards the end there, their starting wide receiver corpse was Juju Smith-Schuster, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Kadarius Toney, you know, Miko Hartman was in there. Like, those aren't stud wide receivers that you see at a lot of other teams. They made it work with a patch mismatch wide receiver group. And so the constant in that equation, again, is Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes. Both of those guys aren't going anywhere soon. And I think as long as they can keep their defense at a average to above average level to slow teams down enough, yeah, I, 100% a dynasty in my opinion. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, one of the other constants is Eric Bieniemy, and I, I'm going to throw this in here on you guys here in a minute. I have a hard time, like, even thinking of my early 90s Cowboys as a dynasty, and they won three in four <laughs> years. It's it's To me, it's too early. Like, if I go back – you know, late 60s, early 70s, Green Bay Packers, no doubt about that. That was that was a dynasty. Pittsburgh Steelers, I think it was four in six years that they ended up winning. Definite dynasty. San Francisco 49ers, between you know, what they did throughout the 80s and then obviously into, I think that would have been the 94 season. They won their last Super Bowl with, with Steve Young. You know, that was that was that was a dynasty, you know, especially when you can win multiple championships across decades i have a hard time i have a hard time putting the chiefs in dynasty category right now i think they've probably even got to win. like if they win back to back maybe i start thinking about them i, I think they've got to win at least two more before i really Ooh, start set the bar even higher that's right look at you that's right john banco says the 90s cowboys were a dynasty you know and again it's like it came and went so quick because they won three and four years, and then they never even got to the a uh, NFC Championship game after that, after Super Bowl Thirty. And you know, like Jesse is is about to turn twenty seven years old next month. He was born a couple months after they won Super Bowl Thirty, and they've <laughs> never sense. even been to the NFC Championship game in his lifetime. So crazy how like, that works it's it's hard for me to you know they were really good in that short amount of time the cowboys were and you know everybody knows that i'm a, a cowboys fan but no way you know. <laughs> uh well joe joe is saying 60s packers dynasty uh, 60s and i'm trying to think of when it would have been yeah i guess it would have ended before the 70s rolled rolled around because they were obviously winning nfl championships you know, before they're, you know, the, the, the AFC merger and all that. So I definitely consider the Packers a dynasty because, you know, pre-Super Bowl era, you still have to factor some of that stuff in. And you can even probably, you know, the Cleveland Browns were actually really good back before that. But speaking of the Chiefs, their offensive coordinator, Eric Bieniemy, the guy who, you know, has not been able to get the head coaching job, he's apparently going to leave to become the offensive coordinator for the Washington Commanders, do you buy wow. or sell it as a good move for Bienemy? That's a huge sell. That's a downgrade. That is not even a parallel move. I mean, unless 
the only way you could even look at it as a good move for him is if he's going to be the actual offensive coordinator and calling all the plays. Because obviously that is not the case in Kansas City. Andy Reid is the offensive genius there. He's the one calling the plays. The enemy is just the offensive coordinator by name, right? So if he goes to Washington, he's probably going to have the whole offense to himself. So you're going to have one of two outcomes. You're either going to have a ton of success offensively, and it's going to be like, yes, this guy's going to be a head coach, or it's going to go the other way, and they'll be like, well, see what? You can't even do it without Andy Reid. So he's taking a chance on himself. He's he's getting outside of his comfort zone, leaving Kansas City on this one. But I, frankly, I would sell. But if he thinks it's the right move for him, then so be it. I think that overall he must be getting some sort of feedback that, yes, he's impressive and that there's always a lot of people clamoring for him to get those head coaching opportunities. And I'm saying he must be getting the feedback in these head coaching opportunities and interviews that maybe, you know, he needs to step up to the plate a little bit more because of what you're talking about. Andy Reid kind of being the mastermind behind a lot of it you know, the level of collaboration that they sure. have. I don't know the answers to those things, but I feel like going to Washington is that case to really step it up, take something that's not really great, and if you can drastically improve it, that's all on you. You can take all of the credit in that situation. So I think I buy it more than a, a lot of people will, um, but overall, it, it's a sell for me because of it's not really, there, there's no promotion in it. It's it's a promotion if he can, you know, on, on the backside, get everything to, to, to succeed. Yeah. I mean, I agree with what the rationalization would be for him with what you were just talking about there, Jesse, like he's trying to, you know, separate himself from Andy Reed and, and prove that he can be the guy on his own. The problem is the organization that he's going to work for Seriously. because I mean, it, like John just said, you couldn't pay me enough to work for Daniel Snyder. And that's just, that has become like, you think the Cowboys are a dysfunctional organization, like the Cal or the, the Washington, the commanders, Oof. it's just like from top to bottom, that is not the organization. I would, if, if my career depends on it, I would much rather like stick around with Andy Reed for another year and, and find another landing spot. You know, I, I realized that, you know, maybe some of these places that are going to give you the opportunity like they might not all be the most desirable, but that would be one of the last places mm -hmm. I would want to go if I'm betting my career <laughs> on getting some, you know, big head coaching advancement or whatever. That would not be the place that I would be, want to be. Agreed. That that's where coaches and players go to die. It seems yes. like recently. I, I just, I you know, if you if I was a betting man, I say it could go either way, right? Either he, his offense is going to have a ton of success, or it's going to go the other way, and they'd be like, "Well, you shouldn't have left." It's going to go the other way. I just, I, I don't have a good feeling about this for him. I just don't. And I'm sure Jesse's absolutely right about the fact that he is getting feedback that they need to see if he can do it outside of the umbrella of Andy Reid. But there has, there had to have been other opportunities with other organizations where he would have had that chance. Notre Dame obviously is the choice that you should have went with. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> obviously. Right. His buyout was probably too big, Jesse. <laughs> so more Super Bowl discussion. Former ESPN president John Skipper did an interview this week, and he said the, in, the NFL could increase their revenue if they made the Super Bowl a pay-per-view event rather than broadcast TV. Would you watch the Super Bowl if you had to pay for it? I would. I admit it because a lot of times when I'm watching the Super Bowl, I have a group of people with me, you know, more than probably four or five. And if I hosted it, I would just slap everyone with that Venmo and say, all right, you know, pony up. We're paying 10 bucks each to watch it. And I know if I went somewhere else, I would be OK with the same thing. I wouldn't want it to come to that. And I think it's a stupid idea if it came to that. But at the end of the day, I would be paying to watch, to watch the Super Bowl. Sean, I'm going to turn this around. What do you think I would say to that? Well, Come I know, on. I know Vince. You know me. If Vince had I to pay Vince. a penny for the Super Bowl, he wouldn't pay for it. That's right. If Vince's father-in-law had the subscription and he could, <laughs> <you know. laughs> it's well played, right there, pal. 
there's not a chance. There is no chance. I watched the Super Bowl literally by myself at my house. <laughs> I'm not paying to watch that. I'll have, somebody can tell me what happens. Like there is no chance I would ever pay to watch. Vince is looking for the illegal streams before he pays. Absolutely, anything. I got a couple I could send your way. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I I understand the rationalization to an extent that Skipper is talking about here. You know, one I would not pay it. First of all, I, I even as a a big football fan like me, unless my team is playing in it, right. I'm not going to pay like forty, fifty, whatever dollars to watch the Super Bowl. And like the way it is set up right now, like he's talking about this would make the NFL money. Well, the NFL already gets billions of dollars from these right. broadcast partners who are paying them rights fees. And then the network that gets the Super Bowl is making, you know, multi-million dollars for, for ad revenue on those games, as well as the ad revenue that they're getting during the season. Because we've, as we've talked about before, last year, 82 of the top 100 most watched <laughs> TV programs were NFL football games. Right. And the Super Bowl is obviously always going to be at the top of the list. You know, it got over 113 million this year. So I don't understand how, like, so if you make this a pay-per-view event, you're you're also taking away broadcast rights fees from the right. networks that are that are part of this. They're, you know, because they're not going to be broadcasting those games and they're going to lose ad revenue. So, like, it it seems like this would actually have a negative effect on the, everybody. I, I just, I don't think it would make what he's saying that it would make. The the NFL is not hurting for money. They, they don't, <laughs> they don't need more money. Like they're doing just fine. They're, they're one of the most cash heavy, you know, companies out there. They, they don't need more money. They're doing just fine yeah. specifically with the Super Bowl. But Joe makes a great point because if there's one truth in life, corporations never That's have fair. money. I get that. They're, on the head. they're never going to be satisfied. You're right. You're you're absolutely right, though. Same I reason do. Notre Dame wouldn't spend any money earlier this week. Yeah. Because you know, there's we know the we know the money's there, but right. it's a matter of actually spending I, the money. I, I think that there would be, you know, what was there, 113 million people watched the Super Bowl? Is that the number you gave me the other day? Uh -huh. That number would go down. That number would go down. I think if they so made too. Pay per view. I think it goes down drastically. There's a lot of hangers on. Half. There's yeah. a lot of hangers on that watch the Super Bowl for the commercials or for whatever, right? I don't think people are going to pony up for the pay per view to watch the commercials. You know what I mean? I just don't yeah. see that being the case. Well, and that's the thing. Like, if it's a pay per view, you shouldn't have any commercials, well, right? Good point. Like, you're already paying. Like, why should you be sub subjected to to more advertising? You're going to lose all those people pay. anyway. That's right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Super Bowl is obviously to get a big number like that. There are a lot of hangers on, as you said, casual viewers who are tuning into the Super Bowl right. who aren't tuning into, you know, like the most watched regular season, like the highest rated regular season games typically are around 20 million or so. So you're talking about what, five plus times, almost six times that amount. Just but Jesse, idea. Jesse, the, the, the young buck with all the cash. I know, just seriously, it just... <laughs> I had some good wins today. <laughs> what did. is even going on today? The Genesis Open. Tiger Woods is, uh, you know, doing good. Wow, you are a degenerate gambler. <laughs> Joe's got a super chat. We appreciate it, Joe. With this craziness behind us, with the coaching turnover, let me ask this. If, after all the interviews, what initially came out was Gino. Gadooli. See, I, I've already it's forgot. Gadooli, right? Gadooli. Thank you. <laughs> See, like, I, I kind of said it. I don't have it written today. up phonetically. It's yeah, the I don't, Italian invents. It's it's not right. on the top of it's my Gadooli. head. It's Gadooli. It's Gino if what Gadooli. Initially, if what initially came out was Gino Gadooli and Jared Parker, would be happy with that decision. So, what you're asking, Joe, is that they went through all the interviews, none of this stuff blew up, and they hired Gadooli and Parker instead of Ludwig and Moorhead and, you know, all these other guys. Is that kind of what you guys I think? think that's, that's what that's he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Like if okay. you could erase your memory of the Ludwig situation and this is the, the outcome, how would you feel about it? Right. I would have been disappointed. I would have been. I mean, we, we taught, as soon as Tommy Reese interviewed with Alabama, we started talking about the potential replacements. Right. And Sean, you and I did a show together and we kind of, ranked where we had everybody right now that there's 
and, and and Jared Parker was not at my top tier. He was not in my second tier. He was he was lower than all of that, right? And he wasn't even worth the conversation, if I'm being honest. Like I wasn't even willing to bring him up, even though he was a legitimate candidate. I was not willing to bring him up because I thought it was a I thought it was a little bit too soon for him. Okay. Me too. So I would have been disappointed. Now that there's part of me that has to trust what Marcus Freeman decides to do. And if he would have decided after going through all these interviews, having these guys on campus, that Jared Parker was still the right guy. I'd have been disappointed, but I said, okay, well, it's your program. I mean, look, look you, you must've seen something, right? But I still would have been disappointed. So I like the idea of a quarterback coach. I would have been on board with that. And I think that's a great kind of addition to the staff. I'm not, I wouldn't have been, like Vince said, I would have been kind of upset uh, with, not even kind of, I would have been upset Mm -hmm. or disappointed with the offensive coordinator hire because I'm never a fan of promoting from self within. Um, I think that especially when you're at kind of a larger program or if you're a more just renowned football team that you can, and you have the ability to go out and capture someone because of you know, basically who you are and your, you know, reputation or rep, reputation and legacy within the sport, then you should be able to go out and, and make a big hire. So on that end, I would have been disappointed, but kind of what you were getting into as well, Vince, you kind of have to ride with what Marcus Freeman has said, because I have bought in on Marcus Freeman. Right. I'm a strong believer in what Marcus Freeman advocates for and how he runs his football program. And if so, he, and as a recruiter, we know he's really good at that. So if he can go out and, and quote unquote recruit or get the coach that he wants, then obviously those guys agree on a lot of things. And he sees, you know, what what he sees in that coordinator aligns right. with how he wants to run his program. So it, it's a little disappointing on one hand, but at the same time, you just kind of have to buckle up and say, well, I trust Marcus Freeman more than anything else. See, and here, here's the problem I would have had with it if it had gone that way. Like they had done the interviews. we never. We never, you know, thought that Ledwood was or anybody else was going to be the guy, and this is the direction that they went. Um, one, we have we 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 still have, you know, we still have the uh, the post BK PTSD, right? You know, like stuff that we've taught and like the history that Brian Kelly had of bringing his friends along. And those guys typically didn't work out. That's why he had to go outside the program to bring in Mike Elko and and Chip Long after the 2016 season. And we saw what happened when he made the promotion of Jeff Quinn. That was just not a good move. We saw what happened when he brought in Brian Van Gorder. That was not a good move. You know, all guys that he had connections to before. So, like, even though this is a new guy, those kind of things like it's like oh really are we going back to that now already you know like the head coach is just going to hire his friends and bring them in because look who's the biggest guy on the staff that we or who's the guy in the staff we have the biggest question with right now al washington sure and he's got a connection to marcus freeman so that would that would have been in the back of my mind had they had they done this you know without any of the other stuff that went around it and it's still there's still a little bit there. There's still a lot to prove from this whole thing. Like, I think I think Jared Parker, as a tight ends coach, did a quality job. And he seems like he's been a good coach. He's got a good track record. Hasn't been at necessarily, you know, really, you know, programs that have had a whole lot of success. But you have to trust, as you guys said, that, that Marcus Freeman trusts him. And, you know, Goodelli, on the other hand, has had a lot of success where he's been. I mean, he's... Yes. Coached and a guy I've, to the college football playoff, yeah. as we talked about. I've seen nothing but positive reviews about Gadouli, you know, as a quarterback's coach. And no, and Notre Dame hasn't had just a straight up quarterback's coach in a long time, right? A- at least a while. Uh, so I am excited about that as well. So look, there's a lot of question marks, and sometimes question marks can be scary, but sometimes they can be really good too. And you know, we're just gonna kind of have to see how it plays out and and all of that. But you know. I think it's going to be very interesting. Anyone um, want to take a shot at Ryan for this comment that he apparently made on the show earlier today? Ryan said Jalen Hurts and John Elway were the same player 
and the whole page melted down along with Brian Driscoll's brain. Brian yeah. probably did explode. His brain probably did explode. Well, that's right, because Brian is... He's an Elway you know, guy yeah. and always has been. And there's no way that you can tell him or me, for that matter. I, I will agree with this one, that Jalen Hurts is John Elway. No way, Jose. Jalen Hurts does not have half the arm that John Elway has. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. Okay, three quarters. John Elway's <laughs> arm was incredibly strong. Big arm. Jalen Hurts does not have that kind of an arm. And Jalen Hurts is almost uh, is also more mobile because like Elway Agreed. was really good at you know getting out of the pocket and you know extending plays with his legs and doing things with his legs. But he is not like he is not the runner Jalen Hurts is. So you know right. I I actually think you know like you know like that's a check to Jalen Hurts. Sure, the pure passing side of things like. Elway had, a, as you said, a huge arm, and he was a he was a pure passer, you know. And right. I, I don't think that you know, to me, like Hertz has an arm, but he's he's not he's not the pure passer. It's not that Elway's John Elway is without the running stuff. He's it's it's a completely different no way completely different game for him. It um it's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison for mm -hmm. me, and I think that that should be enough of the answer because I just think they're two different style of quarterbacks. They're two different plays of quarterbacks. And I think that hurts his system being in the offensive system that the Eagles had, I feel like is more suited for maybe some of the deficiencies that Jalen hurts has, but as a pure natural overall quarterback, I just don't think that there's much of a comparison to be made. Yeah. Johnny says he was poking fun at Brian and I said. could easily see that. Yeah. There's certain okay. buttons you can push. Context. That's yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. And Ryan has obviously learned which buttons they are. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't take him long. Um, anything else that you guys want to hit before we wrap it up? I guess I've got one more question. Do you guys want to do this question or you want to save it for later? Yeah, I had a mini bonus question, too, that I saw. Oh, bonus question. All right. Mini. Bonus question. Okay. All right. Well, I'll give you a mini answer. Let's go. let's <laughs> let's let's go with the one that I've got here first, then, and then Jesse can get his mini bonus question in at the end. So Fox announced during their Super Bowl pregame show, Derek Jeter is going to join their baseball coverage as an Jeter. analyst this season. So my question is, whose broadcasting career are you more anxious to see get started, Jeter or Tom Brady? I'm going to go with Derek Jeter just because I feel like most of Jeter's kind of prime and success when, was when I was a little bit younger. And I've seen more of Tom Brady. I know more of kind of who he is and his personality. I don't know if I can say the same for Derek Jeter. So I'd like to see some of who he is, his personality, his inside, you know, kind of brain on, on the game of baseball, the way he thinks, kind of like his past experiences, things like that. And then obviously, you know, he got out of the situation that he was in with the with the Miami Marlins. So just curious, he's he's kind of bounced around a lot of different realms of the, of the sport of baseball. And I just I'm curious to see kind of his wealth of knowledge overall. And I guess the, the way I'll end this is, you know, I, I'm not I, I'm not a huge Yankees fan. I'm not a huge Jeter or A-Rod fan. I respect their careers and what they did. But anything's got to be better than A-Rod if, if we're all being honest. <laughs> You're not wrong there. I mean. Is, is Jeter going to be a color guy or is he going to be like a pregame show guy? They like, haven't said yet. It okay. sounds Either way, like A-Rod has done both more. of those and he's yeah, not very good. The postgame shows, the pregame shows, the color I commentary. think he's going to do – yeah, I think he's going to do more studio. Okay. It's maybe. And that's a heck of a lot easier than doing color. Yeah. So he probably will do just fine. I, I'm interested – I'll say Tom Brady for then, now that I've got a little clarification or potential clarification, because – being a color analyst is not easy. You can't just sit in the booth and just go. It's it right. difficult. It, it takes time, and it takes time to be good with the person that you're paired up with, right? And so if Jeter's not doing that, if he's just being a studio guy where they just lob up questions to him, he's a well-spoken dude. Like, he can do that. Like, he'll be fine. Tom Brady, that's a different conversation, being a color analyst. So I guess I'm more interested to see Tom Brady at this point just based on that. Yeah, I agree, and I watch more of the games than I watch of the pregame shows and and the postgame shows that they have on TV. Especially, you know, well, I guess maybe a little bit more of the pregame shows during the football season, but 
at the same time. Like, I really think that Tom Brady's going to have something to say. And he's he's taken this year off, and he, he wants to kind of work on it over the course of the year and come out strong when he does start in 2024. So, you know, so we have a lot longer to wait. I, I yeah, agree. I think Jeter's going to be better than A-Rod, but the bar is set pretty low there. Yes, it, I still crazy. wonder, like, I, I am at least curious to see what he's going to be like because he had the reputation – of a guy who would always come out, answer the media questions and all that, but also would never say anything. And, you know, that's a little bit like Brady when he was in New England, but Brady, once he made that slide for the last three years to Tampa Bay, he definitely had more to say down there than, you know, and showed more of his personality than he was when he was in New England. Yeah. So we know, you know, he's very smart. He's got all this football knowledge. And I think that he actually will come out and potentially be more opinionated based on yeah. the Tom Brady we saw in Tampa, you know, and like he's got his podcast and all that stuff. So he's been working on it. So I I'm a, I'm a little bit, a little bit more up on Brady, especially since we've got like this whole, we've got another year to talk right. about Greg Olson and Greg Olson's going to lose his job in a year, you know, when Tom Brady comes and all that kind of stuff. So it can't come soon enough for Jesse. <laughs> You know, I next year's a new year for me <laughs> and Greg Olson. I'll give him another try. Yeah. All right. What's your mini question? What do yeah, you got? What's your mini question before we wrap oh, things up? Oh, wow. Up? Okay. So I saw a tweet today. Um, I don't know the the validity of this. So I, if it if it doesn't turn out to be true, I just would want your guys' uh, take on it. The okay. NFL is expected to look into banning where they are now deeming the tush push quarterback sneak method this offseason essentially where four or five guys get behind the quarterback and just push them aka every the short down play, play for the eagles yeah it's gonna be yeah. it would be deemed the jalen hurts rule if it came down to it so i'm all curious simple would you guys be for or against the ban of that sort of play i don't really have a problem with it because i guess my my argument would be What's the difference between pushing him at the snap of the ball for a quarterback sneak and five yards down the field when you get stopped and then the yeah. entire offensive line comes and pushes him another five yards? What's the difference? If you're going to ban it all, then ban it all. If you're not going to ban that part, then why ban the quarterback sneak push? So I'm, I I say keep it. Yeah. I mean, it definitely benefits Jalen Hurts because he's you know so strong in his legs and the whole thing. He's got a good offensive line and then you get a little bit of push behind. I mean, it's like, did that play ever get stopped this season? But I'm still also, convinced the Eagles could line up and run that play four straight times, similar get a to first a triple down. option, and get a first down every time. I know. Like, how did how did Notre Dame get stopped against USC with the Mitchell Palooza? It's basically the same play. It's mm -hmm. like yeah. they, they just weren't – Notre Dame wasn't committed day. to it like the Eagles were. Those were big, strong men committed to that play yeah. and the physicality that it was going to take to make that – to well, get three to four yards, it seemed like every time. And like you heard Greg Olson talking a lot about it, and this is one of the things that he did well during the Super Bowl, the fact that, <laughs> that you know, when they get into those third down situations, like when it's third and five, third and four, they have full confidence that they can run the ball twice and they can pick up that first down, you know, as long as it's not fourth and three <laughs> with that kind of run play. You know, and it's like they – they had a lot of success doing it. I've got no problem with it. Stop it. You know, if you yeah. don't want people to succeed with it, just stop it. That's all exactly. you got to do. Just pile it up in the middle, you know, rugby scrum. But then, you know, you're going to have guys that are just going to pull out and throw it over the top or whatever. But that's called strategy. Right. So I don't know. It's, no it's also that, what you know. we expected Mitchell Evans to do at some point, but that yeah. never happened. Never See, got it. This is exactly what I wanted. You guys talked to me off the ledge of a irrational first response <laughs> that I, I just I hated it at first. But now I've realized that, like, if you want it to stop it, then stop it. You have just as many capable bodies on the other side yes. that can come together and, and form. I guess the only reason why I was so against it, because it, it just felt like a rugby scrum to me. It just felt like there was nothing to it. It didn't involve any sort of skill. And that was kind of where I was caught up. It doesn't really necessarily remind me of a football play if that makes sense but you know if it, it, it's I get it yeah like there's just no structure or strategic to it it's just you're literally getting the ball and all moving a scrum and, and using your mass to move another mass so 
I don't know, but now the flip side, I do believe that if you want it to stop, then you know, figure something out to stop it. That's usually how most offenses go in the NFL. Is you know, when Lamar was first introduced, the offense was unorthodox, yeah. but defensive mm-hmm. coordinators finally found a way to kind of at least slow him down in regards. Yeah, I mean, Eagles are going to have a lot of questions going forward. One, they got a new offensive coordinator. Two, just what you talked about right there, like these sort of more gimmicky offenses you know like you can you can have a lot of success for a year or two but then the rest of the league catches up you have to play a first place schedule you know that that factors in there as well they didn't have to play a first place schedule this year you know yeah Jesse the crazy thing in the out, nfl is once one person finds out the cheat codes get leaked to everyone else yeah but i mean <laughs> look at the mvp season that that lamar jackson had a few years ago and look at where he is and that that offense is right now it's night and day difference. And, sure. and and now you're also, it's already being talked about paying Jalen Hurts. And in the NFL, that changes once you have to pay the quarterback. Things you can do with the rest sure. of the roster. So, All right, guys. A lot of great topics tonight. Appreciate the input from yes, uh, our viewers and, and listeners tonight. Something smells really good in my house oh, right now. I'm jealous. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it smells good. All right, well, you guys have a great weekend, and Vince, I will see you Monday. Yes, sir. See everybody else Monday as well. Have a good weekend. Ivy Nation Sports Talk. Enjoy, President.